Hello Australia. This is the Layback Podcast, episode number seven. I'm Jackson Allen, and this is a podcast about Australian climbers and their stories. You can watch the podcast over on YouTube. Uh, I do film it, and you'll find the links on thelayback.com if you want to see what we look like in the flesh. In the seat with me this time round is David Reeve, a long-term climber and currently president of the Australian Climbing Association of Queensland. Outside Dave's long history of climbing and mountaineering, he's amassed an array of life experience as a, a botanist, an academic, uh, an engineer, an entrepreneur, uh, and also through his role at the ACAQ. I was eager to pick his brains on a range of different topics, and we actually ended up recording for three hours. That's right, three hours. This one is going to be an epic. Uh, I have trimmed it back to two hours and split it into two one-hour episodes to make make it a little bit more digestible. We start with Dave's early climbing in the Queensland climbing scene in the 60s, uh, something I was really eager to hear about, and he shares some of his experiences in alpinism and mountaineering. We get into David's professional career, which I think gives us a bit of a feel for how he approaches access issues and his role as the president of ACAQ. The rest of the podcast, we pretty much just cover off on access issues in climbing. Uh, we touch on Dave's contribution and experience as the head of ACAQ, what he's learned. Uh, we really get deep into some philosophical discussions around the commodification of climbing and life in general, uh, the rule of Lord Makita, as Dave puts it, that is uh, the ethics around bolting, uh, and Dave's thoughts on how an access body should or should not get involved in those issues. We talk managing the stage and the power of legislation in ensuring outdoor recreation continues to have a voice in the way public land is used. We get into politics and Dave explains his thoughts on peacockery, something you'll hear him talk about a lot. Uh, we discuss cultural heritage and the history and philosophy underpinning national parks and public land that forms the context of the access issues that are occurring today. It's hard for me to actually summarize everything because uh, we cover off on so many different things and we do tend to go off on tangents at times uh, and we, uh, it is a bit free-flowing, uh, but I wanted to kind of give it to you in the least edited uh, form I could. Let's get into it. How did you discover climbing? Well, I guess as a kid you discover climbing, you're always climbing trees where you lived on, you know, you're on the edge of the bush mm. around you, there's trees to climb, house to climb, everything gets climbed. And my father was a climber, so I guess it makes sense. Okay, where did he climb? He climbed, he is Brisbane, so okay. very much the same area, even the same bit of bush, so Mount Cutha was his backyard, it was mm. my backyard, I mm. knew it, so he... Morris drew us maps and said, go from, oh, literally four or five years old, we were bush, you know, we were You're crashing. bush bashing. We were and... bush bashing at four or five, yeah. Yeah. He had, he just sort of showed us, I remember things like, this is a creek, creeks all lead, this creek leads another creek, this ridge, if you go over that ridge, that creek will lead into that creek, this is how you navigate by creeks and ridges, you mm. understand the watershed, get on with it and left us to it, really, and we just... We just found out, out we, we found our way, you know. Mm. And he'd climbed, I guess, Glasshouse and all the, you know, Fassifern Valley and down that way. Okay. Barney, Lindsay, all those climbs. Um, yeah. So when would have his peak climbing kind of he period would have been? He would have been in the 30s. But yeah, okay. overlapped people like Bertie Salmon and yeah. things like that. Bertie was around when he, he was climbing. Okay. So, yeah, he... he, he had climbed with his brothers and friends, you know, Crookneck and uh, Tibro and all that stuff. So he came back after the war and, and I guess we were growing up. It wasn't long before we were introduced. I must have been, I remember being on the BOR slabs very, very early childhood memory. I might have been only four or five. Mm -hmm. Going up that and discovering that chair, yeah, you could just bounce down them. It's all right. You kind of stop rolling once you got going, <laughs> and and it was good. I remember being on Crookneck, and he chickened out because the plank wasn't there. There used to be a plank across Salmon's Leap, 
and he's up with a friend from work and I kind of kept going. Yeah, I was, I don't know, primary school, probably, I don't know, six, seven or something. Were you roped up or is no, this... No, 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 just, just soloing up. Just soloing mm, up. He found it. He didn't have a head for it. He was beginning to lose it, whereas I was still keen as. So <laughs> I think I went up crook neck when I was about six, six or seven, I guess. And really? <laughs> I've climbed most of those, yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, so I just loved it, yeah. Yeah. What did climbing look like then versus, you know, kind of how did it... I guess that would have been, what, the early 60s, mid-60s? Oh, then was the 50s. The so, 50s, yeah. yeah. Um, the people were just scrambling. Yeah. You know, Bertie didn't like ropes and that tradition carried from the 30s through. And it was really, I guess, in the 50s, some of the older guys who would be... would have been in the University of Queensland, bushwalkers, they were pretty... I know, they're engineering-minded to them ropes made sense so they were beginning to aid work homemade pittance okay you know and they'll come i we didn't have much any contact really they remember being once on turtle rock and seeing faster because we had taken a rope up to get down into the caves and fascinated to see a rope over the side and there were guys there and i now look back remember it would have been those guys they were climbing about there and they were dangling off a rope off the side there somewhere. So it was bizarre for you to see someone using a rope. Oh, while yeah, climbing. I saw a rope, but I had uh, well, already bought my own. I was going ropes. I didn't, ah, okay. care, I didn't care what Bertie was doing. I went down to the Twong hardware shop and got 120 foot of hemp rope. And yeah, that was my rope. And I used to just drag that round and we used to, you know, and we had, oh, you know, not my, no no carabiners, nothing else with it. It was really just working with a single rope. Lower ourselves down mine shafts and things. <laughs> Why the hell the hell would get back out, yeah. You know? Were you doing large, like long climbs? What were the what, what was kind of the style of climbing that people oh, were attracted to doing? It yeah. was bushwalking that got steep. Okay. That's uh, Queensland bushwalking is even now by anyone else's standards has a very high scrambling level. Probably terrifying. Most other people who who were ramblers and things, what well, Queenslanders bushwalkers will will go up. So bushwalking just became steeper and steeper. That was really where it came from, I think. And then it becomes roped at some point. And so a lot of bushwalkers, you know, they carry short lengths of rope because they're scrambling. And that, that's all it was. And I think you built a head for heights. That was the real challenge, I think, to, as I remember it as a youngster, I deliberately, just deliberately learning and teaching myself to stay calm, okay. push my panic threshold down. Yeah, I remember I was really quite young when I used to work on that. Yeah, okay. That there was no need. Why? Why are you worrying? Look what you're standing on. Why is there a problem? There's not a problem, you know. And you'd have to coax yourself through coax it at a young age. Coax yourself through it, yeah, mm. and teach yourself to, because once you control that, then the world opens up for you. Mm. Was climbing at that point in time more mental than it was physical? Oh, I think it was both, really, okay. in that. But yeah, we weren't. It wouldn't be like mountaineering where you've got, you know, you climb thousands of feet before it even gets steep. So. So I guess it is physical, but not like I discovered when I took up mountaineering. That was, wow, that was something else. When did you take up mountaineering? I took that up when I was about, I left Australia when I was 18, hopped on a plane. Oh, I just wanted to go to New Zealand, go climbing, and then I just never came back. I, wow, these guys are crazy over here. They have a whole new approach to excitement, and so I just didn't come back. <laughs> well, when So you, you left Queensland at some point. I left um, at 18. Yeah. At 18. So that would have been, what, late late 60s? Yeah, late 60s. So I was in the early climbing community, this late 60s, where modern climbing, as we called it then, was just starting. Okay. And I didn't come back. I was hit New Zealand where they weren't doing much modern climbing. So I was a substantially skilled climber against what the alpine climbings were doing. So it allowed me to take on some really quite steep stuff, which other people wouldn't take on. So took, we sort of got very changed it from really slogging to steep snow and ice and Okay. Uh, trying to get ice gear and actually manufacture our very first ice gear and by modifying ice axes and things. We could see where that was heading. Okay. It's funny, yeah, it, it, you know, where it ended up, 
yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, I think that's that's somewhat common that among climbers of that area era because climbing wasn't as developed as we see it today in modern climbing. Oh, and, and you would look at that as an option, but also mountaineering was this this aspect yeah, of climbing that was think, really alluring. I think mountaineering was a real thing mm. for most rock climbers they were heading towards mountaineering. I'd like to come back to what you did before you obviously left um, because I'm eager to understand a little bit about that burgeoning kind of climbing scene yeah. in, in Queensland. But before we come back to that, I mean, what that was there and you were attracted to mountaineering. Why do you think you went mountaineering rather than the kind of climbing that was happening at, say, Frog Buttress and that sort of thing? We, we were climbing mount- – because mountains were there to climb. I mean, from my father's point of view, you were climbing – a mountain, you, you, you're, you know, you're climbing Krugnick, you're climbing Biwa, you're going for the top. At that point, there was no concept of just climbing a lower cliff at the base of it. It wasn't about the difficulty of climbing, it was more about um, yeah. reaching the peak. It's finding mountain. a way up and finding mm. an interesting new way up. So it was all about finding a different way up that mountain. Mm. And that was beginning to change just as I left, that there was a, a rift open between the bushwalkers and the new rock climbers. We got new people climbing in rock climbing that weren't bushwalkers. Okay. Uh, Rick White was an example. And they were very uh, scathing of me going mountaineering. I think Rick used to call it high-altitude endurance walking or something, which was probably (laughs) a reasonable description of it. But no, I was driven by beauty of mountains and Mm. snow snow clad mountains are very beautiful what was the what was the mountaineering community or the i guess the bushwalking community's view of of rick white and that, oh, that kind of group of clients it was very it was very antagonistic yeah mm. we were it was a very egotistical period in in climbing there was a very i think because you were breaking from a norm there was a lot of chest beating and stuff going on. They used to object. You could hear rock climbers a mile off because they'd be shouting and yelling and being rude and, and generally un- antisocial. Mm. And then at night they'd all be drunk as. And so they were very... Um, why? Yeah, it was very... It was very blokey, but it wasn't that we didn't have girls in there. There was a lot of girls in, but they had to tolerate a very blokey culture. Mm. But the go- girls we got were pretty strong. They were more than a match for a lot of the blokes. So it was that sort of culture. It was a lot of, yeah. When I look back on it, it was very different. Mm. But I can kind of rationalise why it came about Mm. because they were breaking from a, they were breaking a mould. They were breaking a norm. Mm. And yeah, so I guess that first started like, even Kangaroo Point, we used to climb it from the ground up because that's what you did. So the early climbs I did there, um, we climbed the ground up. We'd arrive at the bottom. No, we wouldn't come down from the top. Yeah. And we climbed the ground up. But by the time I left, it wasn't many years. We were chucking top ropes over anywhere and seeing if we could climb it. So it was. So, a so you were doing thing. that as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That started very early. And pretty well as I was leaving, by the end of 68, mm. that's what we were doing. We were just chucking a top rope over anywhere and hurling ourselves at it. Yeah. I wonder if you can climb this. And... What was surprising was how that pushed what you could climb up. You discovered. So we pushed very, you know, a really top level hard climbing in Queensland. It was grade 17, what we would now call grade 17. And we very rapidly pushed 18. And we had something we thought was like 20 at Kangaroo Point. It must be. It was harder than other stuff. Yeah, okay. And on top row, mm. but we realised that you could push it. It was mainly campusing with strong fingers and dangling feet because your shoes weren't up to it. Some of the first friction boots were just arriving, but we weren't very good with using them. Ted Case was remarkable in that he could use his feet. I remember looking back, most of us, they just dangled. (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess campusing up a 17 is a little bit trickier than... Yeah, and also you you can limit a number of holes. If you're not using your feet, you kind of... You can only... You know, remember if you're campusing, you only use horizontal holes, right? (laughs) You can't campus on a site. And, and, yeah. and Kangaroo Point is known for its legi- legginess, yeah. right? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 So, But once you get onto a difficult technical kangaroo point, climbing all the little side pulls and pushes and things, yeah, no, nah, there's no way we're climbing now. You know, no way. So, But they were hard. But if you still look at them, 
you can understand them when you get on them now, what they're like. Um, you look on pterodactyl or something like that, or um, Tombstone Row, they were early climbs of mine. Ted and I used to rush out after, you know, lectures. He was more disciplined than me. I'd just climb all the time and complete, com keep failing university. My priorities were pretty clear. I just climbed if anyone was silly enough to come with me. Whereas Ted would go, yeah, well, my dad's going to give me all hell if I don't pass. And um, so he was... So we used to work in the library, and he'd go, right, he was disciplined. We're working from now to now. Then we go climbing. Okay, okay, Ted. So he actually got me through, I think, because without him, I wouldn't have had the discipline. Uh, and so we'd hop on our bikes and roar down to Kangaroo Point and crash through all the shrubbery and stinking rogers. Because it didn't look goods. like... Oh, it wasn't a park. It wasn't there were a white park. goods. It was like a talus slope of white goods at the base that had been hurled off the top. <laughs> So you used to crash around in that. There was even, I kid you not, but God, there's a bad smell one day and we track that down to a body, you know, and we go, oh, yeah, okay, that's a bit bad. I think we'll move along a bit. A body? <laughs> a body, yeah. Oh. Uh, and someone, yeah. Uh, there's be sort of down and outs and things live down there. And, yeah, it was yeah, a different... It, it was that feral. It was really quite feral. Yeah, okay. And it was, oh, it was prickly because you're crashing through it and it's stinking hot and it was, you know... And, Oh, man, it was pretty rough. You had to be keen on climbing. It sounds like you were kind of riding the line between the, the, the group, the bushwalkers, the mountaineering, yep. and then on the other side yep. you are also um, participating in this, this group who were, who were trying to challenge and, yeah. and things. And yeah. So what, what, what led you to, to, to leave that, that edgy kind of group, that oh, climbing group, and, it, and then go over to mountaineering? I, I just loved the mountains, the thought of being on snow and ice. I yeah. just, what I wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. And there we're, were going. Marion was going. I was a, I would have gone down to Tasmania. I was going, to, hey, let's go to Tasmania. Well, let's take on. I was after big climbs. I wanted big, not small. I wanted big, big cliffs. They, they drove me, the idea of making your way up a big cliff. And so there were big ones. Federation was just opening things like that. Let's go there. Yeah. And he's going, oh, it'll take you ages to learn the style, to learn it. It's a long way in. So in the end, Marion was going across um, and some of us were going across to New Zealand. I jumped on it last minute. Go, no, OK, I'll go. I'm going. I've got through, finished my exams. Let's go. So I, I just jumped off to there, you know, impulse. Yeah. I had the money, I can buy the ticket, I'm going. Yeah. And when I got there, I loved it. I loved the, um, I could see that they were, I could see I could take my ideas of steepening things. Mm. Yeah, Mary and I did things, we did things. They go, oh no, the route goes right up around there. We go, we're not going up there, we're going straight up this face. Yeah. We went, where everyone was going around, we just started going straight up. And I recognise now that, um, I probably had more optimism for my ability to hold a fall on those conditions. I think it took me a while to understand that steep snow is almost like vertical rock. Um, you, the snow doesn't slow you up much, <laughs> and you and you fall at the same sort of speed just because it's not as steep. You know. How did you learn that lesson? With this, oh, is there a tail oh, there? Yeah, where you, there's you... a tail there. It's Mary and I again. I'd go. I really trusted her, so she was a person that we could climb together. And she would never fall without letting you know she was that sort of climber and I could do likewise. So I was quite happy to be climbing just tied together. I won't climb tied together with anyone, you know, because they, they fall off. They don't know what they're doing. They fall and you're all going to die. But she was good. She always gave warning. So we did this sort of New Zealand style, 60 feet between you, 60 foot coils each climbing. But the difference was we just charged straight up steep stuff. Okay. And... Um, and there was one we went up oh, Mount Dampier, is it? Straight up the front, along the ridge line, and there was some thing. It's only got a number. I can't remember what the number is. It must be feet six o something or other. And we started coming down what was a steep snow and ice gully, and it b branched into a small glacier, and it grew. The glacier grew and turned a corner and down, maybe a thousand or two thousand feet down. We were picking our way down there, and she gave a, a yell, I'm going, and she went, and we're, I was okay, I had time to dig in. 
and she shot past me. So you're falling 120 feet, 60 feet above. She came whistling past. She couldn't get the brakes on. She's and, trying to self-arrest. Yeah, she's just, she couldn't hold it, and she mm. was just rattling down. But she wasn't rolling. She managed to hold it without spinning. Once you start cartwheeling, you're in trouble. The whole thing's kick your feet up so your crampons don't go in so you don't cartwheel. If you cartwheel, you're in trouble. You just can't control it. Mm. So she avoided cartwheeling and she came past, but she completely boom, pulled me out backwards. And I, But she got up. She locked on when she hit and immediately locked. And I got and I fall and I go whistling past her. Bang. I lock in, but I pull her out. She comes past me. We repeated this oh, for about 1,500 feet. Falling one after the other, 120 feet at a time, bang, 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 bang down, <sighs> and 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 we go, and you could see coming up. But the guy said, "Me to turn." We knew it was a big bergschrund. We'd just go down it if we don't get the brakes on. Those things are bottomless, you know, and we, we're going to go down that way. But it was also you mean like like. There was a crevice. Yeah, the, a crevice so you're falling down towards a crevice. Yeah, between the rock. And, and if you don't, if you don't stop soon, you're going to go into this crevice. Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to go into it. Yeah, you're not going to stop in time. So, so that galvanised our thoughts, and we, we're, we're shouting. You know, we, we got this system. As it pulls up, you shout, "Hold!" You know, so you know when it's coming. You know, and 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 try and, and also it was levelling out, so it wasn't as acute. You had a bit more, yeah, yeah, okay. So, and we managed to get the brakes on, and yeah. oh man, it felt like my arms were about a metre longer just from doing these arrests, you know. Oh, we were both, we stand up, <laughs> okay, let's get this back together again. And you go, yeah, that was interesting. You, it's not like falling, ah, and in 10 seconds you impact the ground. It was this slow death as you spun off. And I've also seen other people unfortunately fall spin into a cartwheel and unstoppable you think how can you fall down there but they do and they spin and you watch them go a thousand feet two thousand feet three thousand feet like a rag doll and you go they're dead you know and that took me a while to understand that that and avalanches were the two things i learned could kill you yeah Yeah. did that change your uh, approach or did you did you stick with mountaineering after yeah, those Yeah, I still did. I yeah. was very um, careful, I think. But how has climbing kind of evolved for you since then? You lived in Scotland for a while, you mentioned, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you moved back to Australia at some point. How, how, how has your climbing kind of evolved over the years? I think it, it went. I went into, um, at some point, you know, in, in the mountaineering, I also did a lot of uh, caving very because of totally undiscovered caves there and that absolutely deep, deep caves. And that really deep climbing downwards basically completely gripped me as well because they're absolutely brand new. You knew nothing about what was down. That's a very unique experience to have that. And so that also occupied a lot of my time and that was technically the same challenge. I'm an engineering brain, I was bringing technology to it. You know, people, oh, you can't do that, you can't get down here, watch me. I introduced them to bolting. They'd never seen bolting before. I bought that from Australia. You know, tiny little bolts, hand drills, no tungsten carbide. Half an hour to set a bolt in, something like 20 millimetres. It's a quarter inch bolt, you know, six mil by one millimetre. And you have a whole lot of people hanging off it. I mean, yeah, it's pretty wild compared to what we have now. But it enabled you to do things. Similarly, if you're escaping off an alpine cliff, you came to the end and there's nowhere to get an anchor. We always carried that. We could at least set, set, set a tiny bolt set in and we could wrap off that half an hour to set it, but at least you got off. Um, so there was that. Bolting was starting. We had hangers. We made hangers in um, in according to, you know, what Eubank had started. And, um, and we made hangers, you know, in the um, fireplace. We'd put a vacuum clean under the fireplace, turn it into a forge, just about set fire to the chimney, and <laughs> hammer out these things and drill them and make make hangers out of mild steel mm. and bolts. So yeah, things things were moving. We modified ice axes, same thing, same thing. Forged them to actually increase the size of the hook and the pick and shorten the handle down and so on. Um, and so there were, you know, we we were moving in 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 that direction. When I was in Australia, I made some of the very first 
what would become nuts. We used to call them crackers because I think that's what the Americans called them, or maybe the English. And I bought in lengths of hexagonal. You had to buy a heap of it because you could only buy it from a steel from a stockholder. And we hacked them with, you know, no power hacksaws. Hacked it by hand with a hacksaw and a hand drill. Drilled all the holes in them. Threaded them with wire. Went to a ship's chandler and did that. Tested them at the engineering department in Queensland University. Put them on a pull rig. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were still around and left. I keep thinking, I think most people must have souvenired them where I bailed off them. <laughs> I think people have probably found them. I don't know, but... They were the very first, so that was the first non pitten gear. I, I built that just as I left New Zealand. And I think within a matter of years, those stuff was available. Chrome Molly was available. Cams weren't available. So by the time I was leaving and I was becoming, my academic interests increased. I was engineering academic as my real passion in life. What was your focus with the engineering? Well, it wasn't... Engineering was interesting. It was really my love of it, but I, my maths wasn't good enough to ever really make it. was I, as many years before my maths grew to a level, I was very slow in mm. maths. And so I, I got sidetracked. And pure science, chemistry was probably my main love, um, chemistry. And I got sidetracked into botany, strangely enough by chain, but there was massive sort of academic challenges into making botany rigorous and chemically rigorous. So that's what I did. Uh, I, I built a lot of instrumentation for it, and that was engineering. My electronics was pretty good from a very early age, so I could bring that to it. And so analytical chemistry and so on was a big interest, and I, I applied that into the botanical sciences. and made a career in that, so I ended up in lecturing in Scotland where we had a lot of money for that department, so we had a lot of very cool equipment for a, for a um, probably better than a lot of chemistry departments for a um, botany department. Had a lot of support in that. And eventually that was just went bad on me. It went bad because I could see the staff-to-student ratio was becoming an issue. Dumbing down universities was an issue. Giving away degrees was becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. We had to pass people or you didn't get the students, you didn't get the grants. I just fell out with that entirely. It wasn't how I do things. I was, you got frustrated with the, with the academic system? With, with, with this for, the for failing academic standards. Mm. And so, but because I would built a lot of my own equipment, it allowed me to move into, I just set my own business up selling what I'd made. Mm. And there was a big market in the pharmaceutical industry for what I was doing. I'd like drug metabolism was very closely allied to what I was doing. Yeah. So I stepped across on that, uh, had a high-tech startup, mm. which was uh, probably something I'd always wanted to do. And... Yeah, it was massively um, addictive. So there wasn't much climbing. That was just 24 hours a day, obsession for many years of my life. And I have fitted a family in there somewhere. Yep. I, I think probably not the best of fathers in that. I was just working flat out all the time. Mm. I did that for 17 years and then I began to think, why am I doing this? You know, it's like... I couldn't get across into other areas. It was our market was getting taken over by big companies. What was novel was no longer novel. I couldn't get my business across. So I spent a lot of time just developing ideas that fascinated me. I almost funded my own research. And it was like a lifestyle company by the end. Yeah. I got enough sales, enough business, but a lot of the time I was just doing interesting things I wanted to do. That might work. I wonder what that does. I wonder what that does. You yeah. know. And I made an air pollution. I looked at that. Then I realised that was highly politicised. People weren't interested in real results. They were interested in politicised results. They weren't interested in actually what the particulate levels are. They were interested in made up particulate levels. So that was very frustrating as well. So I go, whatever. I'll just measure my own stuff, publish my own stuff on the internet. I just ended up... I just end up I've always been an anarchist I think I just went my own way yeah but because I'm good at what I do I can make a living out of it mm. out of it so in the end of the day well I'm not going to argue with you at the end of the day people buy stuff off me because it works mm. um, that is that's what matters and mm. that was my passion and I guess kind of my climbing is a bit the same when you think, think about it I do what I do I'm a bit of an anarchist yeah. and um 
I I sold that business, and but I didn't get far. I thought I'd retire, but that didn't get far. I got picked up by another little high tech company in Glasgow, and I'm still working for them in the form of that company. That's company's Phoenix about two or three times, and, and but I've been involved in it on and off, and that fascinated me. I can do that from home. I still do, and we're in an area now where we're going. It's just a handful of us, but we're massive demand for it and I should have retired years ago and I can't give it up right so that's a passion I work on the, all night I'm normally working at night talking to those guys talking to customers mm. driving that sort of business it links across into so many areas in biomedicine and whole range of stuff all the automation and car systems and sensors is related to what we do we've got massive demand for that market and we we have a know-how that we don't share with people yeah. we know how to do this come to us if you want this done yeah. um people eventually work it out of course because at the end of it it's just physics they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll stumble across it you know yeah. and my maths is a lot better than it used to be so it lets, lets me do it right yeah. um but i then got i had a dabble in um autonomous vehicles here for about 10 years in a um brisbane startup i loved that that went into a big company was bought over i enjoyed the challenge of trying to steer a big company from the bottom that was challenging it can't be done without firing the only way i could see of doing it ultimately was displacing the managing director or you know the chief executive and that wasn't going to happen you know but i sat there rocking the boat and doing my best till eventually they flung, they flung me out as the grumpy old git uh, so, so a lot of entrepreneurial experiences yeah yeah a lot, entrepreneurial at heart yeah, yeah yeah and and uh and i and i guess that experience that you describe punching up up from the bottom yeah is is something that maybe characterizes oh, you oh i loved it i love the challenge of it it's words words mm. are very dangerous i've I've had a long interest from uh, high school in li in literature. Yeah, unusual for people for a scientist, but I ex passion in my spare time. You know, I've got most modern English novelists through. You know, all the classics, to the Greek classics, to the Enlightenment, to Locke, to all that stuff. Yeah. That is my hobby. That is my passion for many, many years mm. in spare time. So it makes me quite good with words. Mm. And and I discovered that words were dangerous. I could use them. I could use them as an entrepreneur and driving where I want to do. I realized them as an academic. I rose very fast and I realized that people start thinking you're the latest thing. It was terrifying, and they come behind you. And they, I realised before long that it didn't matter what I said, people would think it was the greatest and the latest. I realised I could take a, a lecture theatre of a large number of people and have them under my spell. I began to realise I could do that. I could work that crowd, and I turned away from it. That's what I turned away in academia, because I realised it's not what I wanted to do. Yeah. It was a form of megalomania. I could see it. I could go, no, I don't do that. Yeah. It's not what I wanted in my life, and I, tur I turned away. Part of me is just not like that. I mm. uh, And uh, I followed that other side of me that's more curious and more kind. R running to a business, I could build a system where I could say how we run in commerce, what our values are, how we are kind in our business, how we look after our employees. I could use that same skill to build tremendous loyalty in my in my employees that interested me a lot more mm. and it still does it is as people know or hear me i say to people you must be kind to others mm. if you're not you you will build something but it's a very fragile structure yeah it will it it will come down around you mm. you that must be your driving aim to be useful to people mm. that's the other thing what i do i want to be useful and it, it gradually grew, I guess, out of... It's a personal path. Mm. And it sounds very wishy-washy. I know it sounds like... A, now I'm older, I can say it. I'm an old git, and old gits are allowed to come out with stupid crap like that. You know, yeah, right, sure thing, Grandpa. You know, but I love it because I can say it and, and get away with it. But I, I truly believe it. Mm. 
it, it's a path of power. Mm. Believe it or not, it's a path of power. Mm. Being kind to others. <laughs> So let's let's parlay that into uh, into the access work that that you've done, um, because that is an organisation that uh, you've um, you've been a part of. You're, you're currently the the president yep. of the Australian Climbers Association of Queensland. So to for the listeners who may not have heard of ACAQ, um, what is the ACAQ and, and how does it fit into the array of climbing organisations yeah. in Australia? It's it's pretty clear now, um, but I, when I was cast into it, it wasn't so clear. But, in fact, I hadn't really thought about it until I was cast into it because we were all, I was just climbing like everyone else. We climb. We don't think much about it. And, uh, we would, and we're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to put bolts in national parks, and national parks might like it, but they've got to catch us. You know, what are they going to do about it? It was like... Oh, I'm not going to wreck a national park. I'll go to my way to look after it and be a good steward of it. But I fail to see how a mountain shedding tons of rock a year that a bolt into it is a problem to it. Tracking is a problem to it. Wrecking the vegetation is a problem to it. I'm a botanist. I hate people wrecking my plants mm. on my mountains. I love them for the plants that grow on them. Mm. You know, so there's no question that I don't need the National Park to tell me what's right and wrong. I'll tell them what's right and wrong and see where I come from. It's the story of my life. Mm. I'm not having you telling me. I'm telling you, let's, let's get this the right way around. Mm. This is a public good. This is for the people, not for you. And I will look after it. So there was no problem there. I didn't see it until we were blocked at Flinders Cave. And I go, whoa, what do you guys think you're doing? And so they formed like a, an association and everyone got together and got very upset and made noises. And then they all went away and nothing happened. And about a year later, Adam Gibson who I kind of knew of him, he's amongst the university climbers. I, you know, we spoke to the young guys a lot. We were out climbing, we'd see them. I kind of knew him. He said, well, he decided, no, I'm taking this forward. And he invited me as a token old guy because I think I'd done several things at Kangaroo Point. They'd asked me, hey, do you want to retrobolt some of your climbs? And I saw no reason why not. It added value to them. I'm quite happy to retrobolt them. I went down and helped them. So... You know, it was clear where I stood as an oldie. I wasn't one of the bearded oldies who'd swig a hex at you. You know, I'd protect certain climbs. I understand the value of them, but I'm not. I also understood modern sport climbing. I understood the range of them. I understood young people. And so, yeah, I was in there. So before long, I found myself. We hadn't got any distance, and we were called in by national parks into a meeting and we walked into this incredibly aggressive meeting there was a bunch of them there was two of us and about 12 of them and they just laid down the law to us this is what you're going to do what did they say oh it was like right you're going to listen to us there's going to be no more bolts and so I let them go on. I'm used to aggressive meetings, you know. So I'm, I'm a businessman. I, I learned very. I learned the hard way. Mm. You don't betray your people. You fight for your people. That's what you are. Mm. You fight. And so I just let them go on. And I said, okay, I hear what you're saying. Okay, let me tell you a few things. You know, I've been overseas for a long time. I came back here, and I saw you guys. You guys have allowed, you know, uh, urban encroachment on my beautiful mountains. There used to be grass trees, do you know that? Up and down, there isn't one left. Do you know what happened? You guys allowed them to be taken and sold in the flea markets. That was a national park. Was it you? And I, I've got this trick. I'm used to handling people in meetings. I point at people. Was it you? Was it you? Did you do that? Was it you? Who, who, who am I? I'm looking for someone to blame. Which of you guys was responsible for that? And you see them, they sit back, you read the body language, they sit back in their seats and they go, whoops. Who did that? Because I'm after you. Don't you talk to me about damage in national parks. Don't you dare. I'm after you guys. It's not climbers doing it. We love our parks. Mm. Don't you tell me this. And also, why are you talking to me? How am I going to talk to a thousand climbers 
Why should they listen to me if you're talking this crap? Whatever you sell me, you have to sell me, I can sell something downstream. It has to be saleable. At the moment, you are not got a saleable commodity. You've just got rubbish. I'm not going to have this. Give me a saleable commodity, and I'll earnestly do anything that helps our national parks go forward. But I want you guys to do your job. And we just walked out. And we go, wow, that was interesting. And yeah, and you go, what happened after that? Well, we got approached. Okay, we're working on this. Would you like to help us work on that? And there were some good good people in that department. And they, they, yeah, it was great. We got together. We began to work. And very early on, within a couple of years, we had an operating policy for the national parks. This is their guiding policy. I guided them on bolting. I said, don't you set standards. You set yourself up for public liability case, do not do that. Use motherhood statements about this standard, that standard, best practice. And we went through it and we ended up with what is still basically a good policy. It still contains stuff. It says basically um, it's understood that bolts are necessary for modern climbing, but the national parks would like to at least understand when they're going in, you should be asking. Um, I don't push back against that because I believe ultimately they are the land manager Mm. and at some point we are going to see rogue bolters. We are going to see people who have no respect for the national parks overdevelop or they're not developing with respect to how do we get this number of climbers into this park Mm. or do we bolt this area which has actually got these very unique natural values and trash it just because climbers want to climb it? Mm. There have to be limits. Mm. And we as climbers have to understand that it's all about balance. Mm. And therefore, they're the land manager. They have to have those powers. And we as climbers, when we've got a problem, go, hey, look at these crazies. We don't want these. You know, as a group, we decide these guys shouldn't be doing it, but they're, they're the new feral guys, right? They're in there. Well, I've gone, I've kind of gone from feral. I'm a bit establishment these days, right? I'm going to go, no, I don't think so. I'm going to photograph you, and I'm, you know, you're going to get whacked with the, with the Nature Conservation Act. Don't you dare do that. We need those teeth. So, and I love it. You see what happens now. Thousands of people go up on, on the gun gun. That's great. I love seeing people up there. We've got to harden the track. We've got to make sure we can carry that traffic. But people should love their national parks. It's the management's job to make sure we don't love it to death. And someone's up there, and it's unbelievable what people do. They'll grab a plant, start digging it up, and put it into a bag, you know. And you go, it's a national park. What if it's going, what? You know, people get their cameras out, take a photo, their phone, go down, follow them down, photograph a car and the registration they get into, and next thing they know, someone knocks on their door at six in the morning, finds a plant, it costs them several thousand dollars. Don't you do that. I'm all for that. But yeah. you did mention somewhere that I've, I've read that you didn't want to become the crag policeman. How does that relate to what you're saying now in terms um, of... I don't think it's our job to do it. I don't think we we set down the laws. What would happen is I want the community to do that. So when it comes to bolting, for example, ACAQ won't take a view. Now, on our page, we'll sponsor a massive fight, the most massive engagement levels we have, like, do we put a bolt on insomnia? Now, this isn't the world's great climb. You know, this is kangaroo point. But there's one point you go up, and if you can't see it from the bottom, I don't know if you know it, you end up being run out to the point, you'll you'll deck from three quarters of the way up. It does say, and we have marked it in the crag, that you want to put a nut in there, don't you? Mm. Okay, do we put a bolt in there or not? It goes on and on. And I steer the argument in terms of range of experience. It's a management view. Range of experiences. If you remove that, you've moved a kangaroo point experience, which is a traditional experience of kangaroo point with the spicy bolting and so on. And so we have these massive arguments where the new people come in and just think we're being plain mean and oldies like me are going no. But at the end of the day, it's not an ACAQ decision. 
yeah. I make that very clear. I say, I just talk about Lord, uh, I talk about Lord Makita. You know, Lord Makita will come in and cut that. And that's not ACAQ going, cut that. Yeah. It might be me acting. I've done it. I'll go up and cut things. But that's me. That's not ACAQ. So you'd separate. So you, mm. you have your own personal, I guess, philosophy. Yeah. And, and you separate that from ACAQ yeah. in a way. Yeah. The, yeah. My take is don't you do that. Mm. You're, you're wrecking an experience. My ACAQ hat on says do we ultimately want to make that a gym without a roof? Because that's where you're heading. Yeah, you're commodifying that. You'll hear me talking about that a lot. You're commodifying the experience that anyone, just like anyone, can walk into a gym, and the gym looks after their safety, and everything's presented for you. Climbing is a commodity that you go in, you pay, and you demand a product. And if you're hurt getting that product, there's product liability of a form. There's a liability there, and you go, I demand that. You go down to Kangaroo Point. You have made a major transition. It might be a bit the same, but it's not. It's not a commodity. It's a. It's actually a wild place, mm. yeah, you know. And as people find, the ground keeps whacking them down there all the time. It doesn't happen in the gym. The whack rate at Kangaroo Point's quite high. That's what it's about. Get over it, sunshine. It's about personal liability. So ACAQ will put out a brochure, and we have this little introductory brochure, and it just says Kangaroo Point is not a gym. That's its message. Yeah. Get over it. Your problem. Mm. And then what we would protect, protect is a range of experiences. Mm. But I won't get involved. As ACAQ, I won't do the... I will argue on the page and try and introduce the range of arguments yeah. and say and try and be kind you know you've got to be kind to people always you end up on this massive fight going on that people coming in try and it's very hard to explain to someone that dude you haven't been climbing long i know you feel you have and i know you feel you want to be able to but look give it a year and you begin to understand. And it happens all the time. The noisy ones come in. Next thing you know, they're on the other side of the fence. Mm. And you go, why would you deny that experience? Mm. You know, it's worth, it's valuable to people. I don't, you know, it's a range of experiences. So that is an access issue in a sense mm. in that you are, there's a management issue there. Are you going to allow... Are you going to allow climbing just to be commodified? I believe that's an access issue. That's why I'm strong with it. I think we have to adventure climbing and we have to protect it. But I don't think ACAQ can go up with the angle grinder. We can't have a vote and go, let's vote for cutting that bolt. No, I think climbing must keep its edge. And I think... The grumpy oldies go up there with angle grinders. That's what they're going to do. Um, the youngsters will go and go, damn it, I'm bolting. They will, but ultimately angle grinders cut faster than bolts and you only have to do it once and people get the idea. Um, I think that is the rule of Lord Marquita is there and I think that's edgy. Yeah. I don't think we have a rule and I can see it happening as the other ACAs kick off. I can see the tendency there. They're beginning to make codes of conduct. And I'm saying to them, do not make codes of conduct that are general. If you look at our code of conduct, it's just about respect. Respect for other climbers, for respect for other styles of climbing, respect for land managers, respect for the environment, respect for Aboriginal cultural values. They are the main respects. And you respect them. We're not saying what that means. We're a bit weasel wordy like that. But there's good reason for it because it's not constant. It's a drifting thing. What respect meant 100 years ago doesn't necessarily mean what it means now. And if you make systems of laws are powerful because of their generality, system of laws should never specify. Regulations specify, they change. Laws don't. Yeah. You talk about that a lot in terms of uh, managing the stage rather than the actors on the yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about building a structure, which is to do with what what do you want to give to future others it's not about you that's the whole thing becomes very fraught becomes very very fraught if people 
are obsessed with themselves. You know, and, and you can't have any sort of conversation in the public space without it. And okay, you can get people form gangs and groups and they go, we all want the same thing. Um, and they think they do. So they form these groups and then anyone outside's evil, two legs good, four legs bad. I mean, it's written everywhere from how people form these groups and then they go on this journey and this journey they're going down and they all think they want the same thing and within the first ford someone wants to cross it here and someone wants to cross it there the first thing someone wants to go this way and that way those guys are the two-legged guys going that way or the four-legged guys are going this way it's classic you've only got i guess i'm a reader of classics it's all through our classics it's what humans do they form groups and they form an idea of values that unite them but they go no distance before they fall apart it's useless you cannot build a stage of any substantial structure suddenly the stage over here is better i'm on this stage so music festival have all the different stages don't they <laughs> how do you create a legacy in aca for future climbers you, if the stage is hard think, to build i realized suddenly that legislation was powerful i can read legislation i've got a very orderly analytical brain so I, I can read it but also i have an interest in classics and so on so i understand a lot of the classic uh, the classic underpinning of you know, the English legal tradition. I understand where it's come from, where people like John Locke and things were struggling with concepts that, that have given us a foundation. And you see these are so powerful because they build a stage mm. that people act on. And so the peacocks get on, they all screech, rock, everyone look at me, and it is. That's what they're about. So you the know. peacocks are land managers in our situation? Well, not really don't have many they're more bureaucrats it's more the people the politicians yeah. the people in activist groups tend to attract peacocks Rock, look at me look at me activism is based on peacockery you know and you know as i describe to people peacock and ease is very quick to learn it, there's only one word if you hear a peacock it goes Rock. Right. And what that means is everyone look at me and they've got their feathers out and they're, and they're, and they're stomping around in their little circle like, uh, like, like they do. But when you look, they're actually ankle deep in their own crap, right? <laughs> it's typical peacock, you know, yeah. right, look at me. But if you looked at their feet, they'll go, actually, I'm not that smart. I'm not that smart. I'm going to die. And I, I rose out of shite. I'm going to disappear back into it. That is a story of my life. If you want to do something other than that, if you want to move beyond that and leave something of legacy, you've got to stop that. <laughs> you've got to stop that, mate, you know. You've got to look at the stage. And so I have this thing where I constantly draw people back and go, that's really interesting, I hear what you're saying. Now can you reframe that in terms of future others? What's that going to do for the kids of tomorrow? What's that going to do? If you can't answer that, you're doomed. If you can answer it, it's kryptonite in a meeting. You can bring down a land manager with it. You can bring down a politician with it. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but what? how is that going to help future of us? It's, it's very old. It's an old rhetorical trick. But it's very, very solid if you want to get people pointing the same way. It's called appeal to the future. And everyone does it. You'll see me do it. I'm ruthless with it. I know what I'm doing when I do it. I teach others to do it. But it is a way we build a future. If you're building a stage, it's for tomorrow. And therefore, we, you must address everything. It's not for us. It's for tomorrow. Part one is done. Go grab a drink or take a pit stop if you're on the road headed to the crag. Whatever you need to do uh, before you hit that next button in your podcast app.